Yeah, I was. I, I never was driven by you know taking a company public. I'm driven by building something great. I like building things that that will last and be around for for decades. I really want to understand what shaped Brian Lee here. So a, a lot of billionaires we study on this show, for example, have this shared experience of having a paper route when they were younger or something similar. And I imagine it's certainly correlation, not causation there, but it, it highlights the drive that they seem to have from a very young age. So I'm curious, what was your version of a paper route when you were younger? That's a great question. Um, and I, I too think that a lot of entrepreneurs are kind of born with you know, certain genetics, you go out and start something or there, there was hustling at a young age and I was really no different. Um, I would say that my version of the paper route was selling candy. <laughs> and so what I would do on Halloween would map out my whole route. I would be the first one out there uh, and I would trick or treat until like midnight and I would have a whole bag of candy. And what I would do is I would put four pieces of candy in a Ziploc bag and then sell them for 25 cents at school the next day. And so it was a lot of fun. I remember my dad once saw me putting candy into a Ziploc bag and Ziploc bags. And he was like, what are you doing? I'm like, well, I'm putting them in these bags and I'm selling them at school for 25 cents. And so he sat down to help me like, you know, create all the Ziploc bags. Cause he thought it was a, he thought it was pretty fun to um, see me hustle like that. So I guess that's, that's my paper route. That's fantastic. It's almost similar to Buffett with his, uh, I think he had gumball machines at a certain point. So <laughs> something kind of similar there. Um, you know, I found this fun fact uh, before we got started here that I, that I had to throw in because I thought your first career step was becoming a lawyer, but I've actually come to find out it was moving to New York to become a rapper. <laughs> so talk to us about this experience. This is so fascinating. What, what did you learn from that, uh, that trip to New York? You know, it's a great, it's a great question. So I, I really wanted to, you know, pursue music uh, when I was younger and I, I really wanted to be a rapper because that's the music I listened to that I grew up listening to. And so a friend of mine decided, Hey, well, I think we should move to New York and, and, and try to, you know, pursue our music careers. And so I went there, we created mixtapes and we we're standing outside of doors trying to hand mixtapes to as many uh, uh, record folks as possible. And it was, it was, it was tough. It's something that I really learned is that, you know, nothing, nothing is easy. No matter how talented you think you are, you've got to work, you know, and it was, a, it was a lot of work. And, um, you know, it was, we gave ourselves a certain time period uh, to go get something done and it just wasn't happening. So after a few months of that, uh, we decided, okay, I'm going to go back to, to Los Angeles and, and uh, go to school. And so I went to UCLA for undergrad and, and law school. Now, going from music to law school, that's a, that's a big step there. And I, I've heard you joke, and I, I know it's not, uh, not true, but you, you've claimed that you were the worst lawyer ever. But what, <laughs> what was it about law that ultimately didn't sit with you and it wasn't a great fit? You know, the thing is, I, I actually enjoyed the people I worked with. I, I thought they were all incredibly smart and driven, hardworking, um, and I enjoyed them. But but it was it was the actual work that I didn't really like. Um, I was in tax law, and I was doing a lot of um, you know just a lot of corporate tax work, and I, I just wasn't getting the fulfillment out of you know the work that I would want. Um, part of it is because I think part of it was. Uh, I was working for large corporate clients. And even if I saved you know, a certain amount of money in taxes, doing certain structures and this and that, it's like, I don't really feel the effects of it. You know, like it wasn't, it wasn't something that you know, resonated with me personally. And so that's when I decided to, to move on and, and, and start my own company. Starting from ground zero without a network, as I know you did there, what, who were some of your earliest mentors and, and how did you actually form those relationships? Yeah. So that's a great question. So I would say, so my earliest mentor, my, my earliest mentor was my father, uh, who was an entrepreneur and I learned a lot from him. I used to work in you know, his warehouses in the summer and kind of, you know, uh, work with the team and so forth. Um, but I would say a couple of mentors of mine were probably uh, the, the lawyers that I worked with um, and so it would be like, uh, like 
Eric Peterson or uh, Ed Gonzalez. Um, and they, they, they really taught me a lot in terms of, you know, how to manage teams and how to lead. Uh, and it's the, the lessons I've, I, I've taken with me um, from the earliest days. And actually, I still, I, I still hang out with these guys. And so, you know, Eric Peterson's a, a, a great friend of mine now. And I, I respect him tremendously and I look up to him. So he's always there when I, when I have questions. So I find it a little bit ironic that you didn't love being a lawyer and yet you went on to build one of the biggest legal uh, digital companies in the entire world. And before we actually get into legal zoom, I'd like to hear a little bit about law garden. Why don't you tell us about that idea first? So law garden, wow, I can't believe you found that, but law garden, um, was our earliest iteration of, of, of sorry, so it was me and uh, Brian Liu, who I went to law school with, and we we're best friends. And our first idea was was that we would have stay at home attorneys answer questions online for ninety nine cents a minute. That was like the the general idea. And so we kind of went down the path. The reason why we named it Law Garden, by the way, is because we we're both into Sound Garden at the time, um, the the band. And so we named it Law Garden and. The problem with it, though, is that in order to uh, hire lawyers throughout the country, you'd have to be licensed in all 50 states, right? So you'd have to pass a bar exam in 50 states, and we neither of us wanted to do that, right? <laughs> it was bad enough to take the California bar exam, let alone, you know, 50 bar exams. Um, the, the second thing is that the malpractice insurance uh, was going to be, you know, pretty high. Uh, but number three, at the end of the day, you're still practicing law. Right, providing legal advice. And as such, we would be classified as a law firm and therefore could not raise capital from non-attorneys. For There's a lot of fee splitting rules in, in law. And so we realized that we couldn't really start that because we couldn't raise outside capital to, to get it done. We could never take the company public. Uh, there are a lot of regulations involved with it. So we moved on and started LegalZoom instead. Fantastic pivot there. I mean, but the yeah. timing of Legal Zoom was also kind of interesting because this is around uh, early 2001, and that's about the time the, the dot com bubble was beginning to burst. And I imagine that was an interesting, you know, environment to start a company in. So, what was it like building during that time? Did you find it that you could find talent easier as as other companies were folding, or what did the overall backdrop look like in the early days? You know, it was it was. It was interesting because it was, we were pretty early, you know, all things considered with, with you know, e-commerce, e-service, uh, online. Um, and I remember, it was, well, it was impossible to raise capital. It's not like we didn't try. You know, we, we probably met with probably 30 venture capital firms or so, and we didn't get a single bite. Um, and so we realized that we were going we were, we were to have to go it alone. Um, and kind of feed ourselves. And so we knew we had to be profitable really from the get-go. Uh, so that's kind of how we started LegalZoom. It was, it, was a, it was an interesting time because to your point, the dot-com crash led a lot of people to question whether or not you know, the internet was viable. I remember one of the VCs we sat down with actually told us the internet's over. <laughs> it's not coming back. I mean, that's how, that's how bad it was back. I wonder where he is today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but that's, that's kind of like the environment. And so, but we really believed in, in technology and what the internet held and the potential of it. And so, you know, without raising any capital, we quit our jobs and we just started working out of our condo um, and just building. And what's so interesting about that is you were building a tech company, even though you were both lawyers. And so what I'm kind of curious about is as you're sitting there in the condo, who's coding all of this? Are, are you guys yeah. sitting in hoodies like Zuckerberg, you know, learning how to code or did you have to hire people early on to help you build this thing? What, what did that look like? No. So we got, we got really lucky. Uh, so we have a very close friend named Eddie Hartman, who was our founding CTO. Uh, one of our co-founders at LegalZoom, and he did all the coding, um, and we worked on the product and marketing and everything else. But um, he was he was fantastic, and he's still one of my best friends and uh, one of the smartest guys I've ever worked with. So Eddie, if you're here listening to this, you're you're, you're truly one of the smartest guys I've ever I've ever met. But yeah, we we got fortunate with him. 
I don't know about Eddie, but I know you and, and your other partner, Brian Liu, were both attorneys and went from these high paying salary jobs at prestigious law firms to, to now building this company and, and living on ramen and peanut butter <laughs> jelly sandwiches and all the things it takes to bootstrap a company like that. This is, this is, uh, this takes a considerable amount of grit. And I'm kind of curious, at least for you, wh- where do you think that side of you comes from? You know, I, I, I'm not exactly sure, Trey. I think I was just kind of born with a lot of grit. Um, I think it, a lot of it has to do with my upbringing, being from an immigrant family. Uh, I was born in Korea. And so when we came to uh, the United States, I remember being poor as hell, honestly, Trey. It's like we couldn't afford food. Um, it, it was, it, and it was tough times. And I remember watching my father uh, work two jobs watching my mom work a factory job, even though they were educated, they have college degrees, they, they didn't speak the language. So when we first started in America, um, they just had to outwork everyone and, 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 and save. And so I kind of think I learned from that a lot, probably without even knowing I was learning, but I, I just saw how hard they worked and how hard it was to you know, provide for your family. So I think that that always stayed with me. Your story does seem to have this sort of archetypal American dream element to it from the, from the immigrant story coming in and, and your father, who I believe became one of the biggest stainless steel suppliers in the world. So he, what an incredible entrepreneurial story he had. And I imagine that had a huge impact on you growing up. What, what was the takeaway? Why didn't, why didn't you want to go into that business? But, and what did you kind of learn from watching him go through that and make you feel like, all right, I want to, I want to do the same thing. Yeah. Um, the thing is, I, I'm actually, I have a great relationship with my father, with my dad. I actually don't think our relationship would be as strong if I had gone into the family business. And I think it's really because we're both super type A personalities and we want things done, you know, the way that we envision them being done. And, and so I, I think we probably would have butted heads a lot if I had joined him. He wanted me to join. Actually, when I told him I was going to law school, uh, that I wanted to go to law school. He was actually the only one that, that, that said, or asked me why, <laughs> like, why would you do that? Why, why don't you just come work for, you know, uh, the family company. And so I, I, I always just knew that I, I, I wanted to forge my own path. Right. And I wanted to, to make a career that, that I wanted to, to set. Um, and in hindsight, you know, I, 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 I kind of question it, right? I, I kind of question, like, I wonder what would have happened if I had taken over the stainless steel company versus, you know, starting legal zoom and starting my own path. But you know, I guess I, I'll never know. Um, but at the same time, you know, my dad's company has done well under my sister who took it over with my brother-in-law. So they're, they're doing great. I brought up the American dream element because it's, it's refreshing actually to hear this story because it, it is so inspiring and it almost, seems like it's straight out of a movie and and some of these uh, early beginnings in uh, legal zoom feel that way as well like the story of actually partnering with Robert Shapiro the famous attorney there's this walk us through this story and how you ended up meeting Robert and what you ultimately learned from partnering with him sure um, and so when we started legal zoom the internet was still relatively new and people were scared of it not a lot of people remember this, like you're too young to remember this, Trey, but, but when it was, when it was new, people were, were scared to put their information online, right? And they were very scared to put their banking information online or their credit card information. You know, they weren't sure where it was going. Um, and so we knew that we had to kind of fix that, right? And, and bring credibility to the site instantly. And that's when we started reaching out to, you know, attorneys that we knew um, because we knew, uh, you know, a famous attorney you know, as part of LegalZoom would lend a lot of credibility. And so Robert Shapiro was at the top of our list um, because he was just coming off the OJ trial. Everyone in America knew him. Uh, and so, and he was right here in Los Angeles. Um, and so I reached out to my network, which was pretty small at the time, but no one knew him um, personally. And so I honestly, I, I called 411 um, this is before Google, right? Where this four one was calling for information. I got, you know, Robert Shapiro, attorney, Center City. I called the number. It was about nine o'clock at night because I, I had my voice message written out. 
and I was going to pitch him on, on, on legal zoom or leave him a message, but he actually picked up the phone and said, this is Robert Shapiro. How can I help you? And I kind of freaked out for a second. I, and I said, Robert Shapiro, the attorney. He said, yes, how can I help you? And so I kind of told him, well, my name is Brian Lee and I've got this business idea uh, called legal zoom. And the first thing he said was, I'm not interested. Right. And he was just about to hang up on me. I thought, and I said, well, wait, how do you know you're not interested if you don't hear me out? And he, he basically said, you got two minutes. And so in those two minutes, I told him the whole story for legal student, the whole vision behind it. And at the end of it, he said something really interesting. He said, you know, I've actually been thinking of something similar, right? And so why don't you call at a normal time tomorrow and set up an appointment to, to come in and we'll, we'll talk. And so that's how we got Robert Shapiro involved. And that's how it started. Now, was Robert the only factor that built trust with customers? Did it, did it just say, take a certain amount of time for people to get comfortable with the internet in general? And did you have to kind of, you know, wade through the waters for, or tread water for a little while while that was kind of developing? You know, it was interesting. I, I think Robert Shapiro brought a lot of credibility, but the, besides just the credibility piece, every time he would go on to CNN or this or that and you know, had an interview, he would mention LegalZoom and we would get more orders, right? So, so I think Robert played a, a, a huge role in bringing that credibility at the earliest stages. But then, you know, what happens about, you know, in terms of building a brand, it does take time. It takes time and in, to build a brand, it takes time, it takes capital, but it also takes, you know, extreme consistency in your promise, Right. I always tell I always tell a lot of entrepreneurs that it, it, it takes time to build a brand, but you'll build brand if you if you just consistently deliver what you promise, and if you do that, then you'll 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 grow, right? And so LegalZoom was the same way. It, it, it's we we got a little lucky with LegalZoom in terms of timing. We were not a lot of people know this, but we were one of the earliest companies to advertise, uh, well, pay for a click. Right, so PPC advertising, pay-per-click advertising was super nascent er, the earliest days. And I had a friend who was at uh, ID Labs in Pasadena, and they were working on the first paid search engine called GoTo. And he called me and said, "Hey, Brian, why don't you try this out? You you, you put money in this account, and you know people do a search, and you'll you'll get ranking based on how much you're paying for a click." I said, "Okay, we'll try it." So we stuck twenty bucks into this account. And after spending about you know a dollar something, we got an order. Like, hey, this actually works, right? So we really grew with paid search. Um, initially, we were paying for. I'll give you an example. Like the term "incorporate" back in the day, when we first started, it was one cent per click. Um, and by the time I had left LegalZoom, people were paying upwards of eighty dollars per click. And so it, it got a little bit insane, uh, but we really kind of ramped with paid search. What was the hero product, if you will, for LegalZoom early on? You were paying for clicks, but what were you trying to attract the customer to do and, and sell? What, what did the product roadmap look like early on? So, yeah, so we, we really thought that we could really kind of uh, democratize law in a lot of ways. And so incorporation services, trademark services, last will and testaments, and living trusts were kind of like the core of what we did. And these were what we considered very simple legal processes or documents that attorneys in general were still charging a lot for, right? And we kind of felt that the masses would prefer to pay, call it $99 to incorporate as opposed to $2,000 at that time. Right. And so that was our thesis. And, and, and sure enough, it, it was true. Right. There's a lot. I, LegalZoom has incorporated more companies than any other entity in America at this point um, uh, and form more wills and living trusts than any other entity in America. And so we really kind of ramped with the core kind of legal document services. But then we always had in the back of our heads that, you know, if we could dominate legal documents and become a brand name in law, you know, we could extend into a myriad of other categories. And so that's kind of like what was the, um, the vision behind LegalZoom was building that brand name and law. One thing you're really well known for is being this e-commerce 
expert because you were so early on there and, and you, you almost pioneered a lot of these strategies. So you mentioned the paid per click opportunity you had early on nowadays. And I don't know if it was like this back then, but a lot of people refer to the metrics of uh, customer acquisition cost or CAC, basically what it sounds like, the cost to acquire the customer and LTV, lifetime value. So you, you're obviously, you're, you're oftentimes referencing the two and how they go together. Lifetime mm-hmm. value being you know the prospective amount of dollars or revenue that'll come from that single customer over time. So these seem like relatively new metrics within the last decade, but that might just be my own personal experience talking. So given your background, you must've been pioneering these metrics early on. How aware of these strategies were you in those early days? You know, we, we were pretty aware of our metrics and our KPIs at LegalZoom. I mean, we would track them, you know, basically every minute. Um, so we knew exactly how much we were paying per click and how much revenue that was generating. We knew that we had a, because we didn't raise outside capital, we knew we had to be profitable within that first order. So we knew how much money we could pay per click for a certain group of customers um, and that the payback would have to be immediate. Now, things did change uh, over time because then you start realizing that that customer is more than that one order, right? And that over, over the lifetime of that customer, they might come back and form another company or you know, make an, a, a revision to their last will and testament, you know, whatever that might be. But that came much later, right? What we were looking for initially was this is the price per click. This is how much we could afford so that we're profitable on the payback uh, on that first order. Um, now, the CAC to LTV ratios that you mentioned, we started implementing at Shoe Dazzle uh, years ago, so, so more than a decade ago. Um, it was, um, we were one of the earliest to really do a lot of social media uh, marketing and influencer marketing at Shoe Dazzle. Can we, uh, just as LegalZoom grew with pay-per-click, Shoe Dazzle grew with Facebook marketing. Right, so the earliest days of Facebook marketing, we kind of fell into, and we understood that, you know, because we were a subscription business for women's shoes, that we could pay ahead in terms of a certain CAC, and over a two-year lifetime value, you know, we could get paid back. So that's how you could get very, very aggressive with your spend, but you got to be careful with that, of course, because LTVs change, right? LTVs change, and anyone who's kind of going out three, four, five years on a lifetime value, the world can change, right? And a lot of other things can change. And, you know, the, the cost on the acquisition side could start getting higher and higher and higher. So a lot to kind of change. So I, I actually always recommend, you know, if possible, do a, do a one or a two year at max kind of lifetime value model. You mentioned uh, LegalZoom being profitable from day one there. And I, I'm kind of curious about that. You, mm-hmm. While you did try to raise money, were there periods where you had to run a deficit to, to grow? I mean, I, or was it, let me, let's start there. Did, were there periods of growth that required deficit spending to get to where you needed to be, or were you always growing yeah. responsibly? No, we always grew responsibly. Uh, we never really hit a deficit uh, at LegalZoom. LegalZoom was always that, it was, a, it was never a sexy business, right? <laughs> right? It was never like, hey, we're going from zero to hundred million, you know, overnight. It was never that business. It was always you know, we grew LegalZoom, call it 10 to 25% year over year profitably. You know, and when you look back, you know, 20 years later, it becomes a sizable business, right? And so for, for us, we always just kind of knew that we had to remain profitable. Um, now, we didn't have enough profits to really try too many new things, Um, But one big lesson I learned at LegalZoom, and I don't share this often, but I remember we got um, this one customer who ordered, I think it was like nine divorces within a month, right? And we're like, wow, this guy's getting married and divorced a lot, (laughs) like nine times in a month. So I called him and I I remember he was out in Florida and I called him up and I said, well, I'm just confirming your ninth divorce order here. Um, and he's like, yeah, absolutely. And, and, he, and he says, when can I get this? And I'm like, oh, we'll have it to you by tomorrow. We'll have all the documents done. And um, I realized that he was an attorney, right? He was a divorce lawyer 
using us to do all the backend documents for him. And of course, like bing, 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 like, oh my goodness, we're more than just a, a, a D2C company. We're actually a B2B company too, right? And so we're, we started like thinking, wow, we could like, you know, double our growth. We could like grow into this other category. And this is about year two of LegalZoom, year three, maybe. Um, and so we started building something called proxy law, right? Which was a much more robust kind of backend paralegal document service for attorneys, for law firms. And we're like, okay, we're going to build this. So we put all of our best resources, our best technologists, Eddie Hartman was working on, like we were all working on proxy law because we thought that was like our next big you know, uh, venture. And so what we realized though, was after we built it, it was very, it was just a very different market, right? Knocking on doors of attorneys, getting them to try a SaaS product was very different than marketing a last will or, you know, corporation services to a uh, an actual consumer. And we almost went broke. There is, there is one time where we couldn't pay payroll, right? Because we sunk all of our money into proxy law. And it's a, just a lesson that I've always taken with me for every company. It's you just got to stay very focused in your core, make sure that you're incredibly strong at your foundation before extending, right? Don't extend until you're ready. And it's just something that I, that I, that I took with me after we almost went bankrupt at LegalZoom. It sounds like it was almost a blessing in disguise that you weren't able to raise venture capital early on. What, do you think that would have actually impacted the business given that it seemed to take a long time to build trust and for the internet to evolve? And do you think you could have even put that money to work the way you would have wanted to? I think it was actually a blessing, Trey. I'm, I'm, I, I think I see it the same way as you do in, in that sense. It, it's, I actually think if we had raised a, a boatload of money uh, for LegalZoom, I don't think it would have worked. I think just by being savvy and, 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 you know, frugal, if you will, making sure that the growth is not, that we're not outgrowing our own infrastructure and, and just being smart with capital. I think it really helped with LegalZoom. I think, cause we'll put it this way. There were probably five or six other legal companies that did receive venture funding back then. And none of them are around today. If you built this baby, I mean, this, this, you spent, years and years on this thing and it became ultra successful. What was the day you woke up and you were saying to yourself, all right, I think I'm, I think I'm good here. Time to move on. Yeah. It's, it's always, it's always tough to make that final decision to move on. Um, But in my case, it was really, it really comes down to the, the best and happiest days of my life at LegalZoom, my career was at the earliest stages, right? Uh, you mentioned that, that I was eating ramen and peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, which is true, right? But I was happiest then. Just being in a room of four or five people iterating and, and, and building very quickly, you know, and coming up with these ideas and trying things and, 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 and so forth, it, it, that, that, that is fun for me, right? Now, so I'm kind of addicted to startups in that sense. Now, once a company scales to you know a thousand employees, it's just a very different company than it was in the earliest stage, right? And so, I, I, I just find a lot more enjoyment at the early stages of a business as opposed to the later stages, where there's just a lot more involved in terms of you know structure, organization, you know decision making, you know a lot of outside factors, your investors, and this and that. There's a lot more going on in terms of that, as opposed to just building. I like building, right? And I'll give you another example. At one of my more recent companies, I remember um, I wanted to change the color of one of the buttons, the continue buttons to green, as opposed to the color yellow that it was in. Um, And I remember I I was talking to the, the product team. I said, why don't we try making that green? And they were like, okay, you know, we'll do that. And then a couple of weeks pass and it's still yellow. And, and then finally we have this meeting and there's probably 15 people in the room and they said, well, we've done all these tests and the right color is purple. Right. And I was thinking to myself, well, that's great. You know, really it's like, it's, it's terrific that, that we decided that, you know, you did the research and did all the, the UX testing and everything else. And purple is the right answer. Terrific. Let's go with purple in my head. I'm thinking I wanted it green. 
<laughs> Does that make sense? So, so that, that little things like that, that, that's when you start realizing like, you know what, it's not moving as quickly as I want it to. And, and I, and I, I really should go off the data and, the, and there's people who are really good at it. Okay. Like take like you know, some of these folks that probably were on your show before, like, like, I don't know, like Jeff Bezos or, you know, Elon Musk or, or whoever these people, the, these ultra successful folks are, they could scale from zero to billions and not miss a beat. Honestly, I'm not like that. I'll be, I'll be honest with you. It's like, I'm really good at the earliest stages. I'm probably not the guy you want running, you know, a multi-billion dollar business. I'll be honest with you. I was kind of interested about that because the people you just mentioned there, they're very bombastic, right? They have really interesting reputations and, you know, Bezos, even Bill Gates, that they're often quoted uh, or references telling employees that they're, that was the stupidest idea I've ever heard. They just they lash out, um, you know, because they're they're so intelligent and they they don't hide it, right? And yeah. you're you are not a very boastful person. And from from just being with you a short while, I can tell you you have this very uh, polite manner about you. And I'm it makes me kind of curious about your style as a CEO because I know there's there's lots of different flavors out there. There's lots of ways to do it. Um, what was your kind of style building culture uh, in those companies early on? I think culture is extremely important at every company. And I think once you establish a culture that's working, stick with it. Because if you change it, things fall apart. And we all know there's a there's a very different culture at Disney as opposed to, you know, Zappos, you know, or Nike, or you know, name the company. They have their own cultures. And it works for them. Right. And, and in, in, in my case, it's the culture that I like to set is one of understanding, communication. Uh, I like to lead by, you know, basically, uh, I have a lot of empathy <laughs> towards people and the team. And I, and I really love people working together um, and iterating together together. Um, it's more like a just honest, open communication, and it's, and it's worked, and it's worked for me, right? But but you know, I would say some of the hardest things I've ever had to do were you know make very firm decisions on firing people. That's always been hard for me. Try, I, I know some CEOs that have no problem like, hey, you know, get rid of these folks. I've always had, I've always like, you know, had hesitancy when it came to like, you know, firing people or laying people off or this or that. And it's like, I remember, you know, at my second coming shoe dazzle, one of the hardest things I had to do was, was lay off like 50% of the people in one day. And it was just, it was just like miserable for me. And so it's just, um, you know, I, 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 I care a lot about our team. I actually believe that, you know, you'll, you'll hear a lot from entrepreneurs who say, oh, well, the customer's always right. And the customer comes first, do right by the customer. I've always actually said the team comes first, right? The team comes first because if you have a, a, a well-oiled team, a, a, a driven team, a team that, that is, that's working well together, that's everything because that leads to happy customers, right? It leads to a better product, better service, better customers, we're to come back to team, but since you mentioned shoot dazzle there, I have heard you say that was a low point and it was, it was somewhat of a short lived part of your career. It would, it would seem what were the dynamics playing out there? Yeah, it was it, legal. I mean, shoot dazzle was, um, it was a really fun business to start, uh, started with Kim Kardashian and she was terrific. Like she, she was, she's one of the hardest working women I think I've ever met truly. Like she's, she's, she's all over it. Um, but we grew it, we launched it, it grew very, very quickly. Um, and then about three years into it, that's when I was going to join the Honest Company with Jessica Alma to start uh, the Honest Company. So we found a CEO to run Shoe Dazzle, and it did, just didn't quite work. Part of it was a culture shift. Um, part of it was for some other reasons. The model was kind of you know, not working as well as we wanted it to. So I came back in to kind of uh, help with shoe dazzle. And you know, it was it was it was tough. That that's when we laid off half the people. We were, you know, kind of rejiggering a lot of things. Um, I mean, luckily we 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 sold it to a a, a competitor. 
Um, and you know, our investors actually were made whole, which was fantastic. Uh, but it's, um, it was just hard. It was just hard. It was just anytime you have to go in and kind of change a lot of major things, it's, it's never easy. And it's like, there are a lot of days at shoot dazzle where we couldn't pay our bills. Right. We had lawyers chasing us. We had the electric company chasing us. We had everyone chasing us. Right. And we just, it was, it was a, it was a, it was a scary time. And I know a lot of entrepreneurs have been there, you know, but luckily we landed the plane um, and, and got out. So from, partnering with Robert Shapiro early on, you, you learned the power of media, right? And, and you partnered with Kim on Shoe Dazzle. I'm kind of curious to know how that came about and were there other considerations or was, was Kim always at the top of your mind as far as the right person for this product in particular? Um, yeah, it's a great question. We knew Kim because her father used to work with Robert Shapiro, my partner at LegalZoom. And so we would see Kim at some of the his events or at dinner or this or that. And it was my wife really that that really wanted to get Kim involved because she had watched the very first episode of keeping up with the Kardashians. And my wife, Mira said, she's going to be huge, right? We should go talk to Kim about shoe dazzle. And so that's who we talked to. We really didn't talk to anyone else. Um, it was really Kim that, that we were focused on and, and sure enough, it worked and, you know, we couldn't afford her today. <laughs> But back then she was, yeah, she was just getting started. And so um, it worked. That was great foresight by your wife. Yeah. So yeah, I'd like to kind of keep moving here on to the Honest Company, which is also now public. Um, I have never really believed in overnight success stories until I studied up on the Honest Company. And because while it might seem like it took some time from the concept to the actual launch, this business was doing something around 160 million or so in revenue in year two, which is just yeah. extraordinary. What do you think ultimately contributed to this initial success? You know, a lot of it has to do with Jessica, with Jessica Alba, uh, who was so incredibly passionate about the product and what we were building. Honest Company, more so than any other company I, I, I've started, was extremely mission-driven. And the, the vision of trying to create a non-toxic world really resonated with you know, a lot of folks, right? From consumers to especially our own team members to, to everyone involved in it. We we're very driven by that, that mission. Um, and so with, with Jessica, she was so incredibly passionate. She would, she would do every interview. She would promote it. Um, and it really resonated with a lot of moms. Um, and, and we knew that it would uh, because at the time we started the Honest Company together, uh, it was really a time where eco was really picking up a lot of steam, right? So eco was like kind of going into the, into the mainstream, but no one was actually talking about chemicals as opposed to the environment. And I inherently knew that, you know, a mother, right, would pay even a slight premium you know, for the safety and well-being of their child, they might not pay that slight premium to save the environment necessarily. Everyone wants to do good for the environment, right? We all do, right? But do we want to pay for it? We will pay for health, right? And, and safety for sure. And that's why I knew like that little nuance for the honest company, that lane to go into non-toxic, you know, chemical-free, was a, a pretty large kind of lane that, that, that was wide open. It's hard to even imagine having enough infrastructure in place to execute that level of revenue so quickly. So what were a couple of the major growing pains you remember most from that year one to year two to year three? Oh yeah. I mean, there was a lot of growing pains, <laughs> uh, a lot of sleepless nights. Um, yeah, it was, it was really, again, bringing in the right people at the right time. Uh, we, we, we couldn't have done it without, you know, the team that we put in place. Um, we were having a lot of issues, you know, when you grow that quickly, you have a lot of eyeballs on you watching your every move. And so we had to be ultra careful in terms of everything that we said and did and produced and everything else. I mean, there, there are so many 
things that we learned early on that we had to fix kind of on the fly. It was almost like flying a plane and fixing the engines as it's in the air. It's a, the same old story. So, so basically, I remember we created these laundry pods once, um, and they're a great product. It was great pods, and and but we would ship them, and we never really tested them in freezing cold weather. And so when we shipped them back east in the winter, they would explode on people's front porches, right? Like stories like that were like <laughs> abundant <laughs> that we had to kind of fix as we were going along. And, and so it, it just it was just a lot of hustle. It was a lot of hustle. Um, a lot of great partners that we worked with that would iterate on, on products very quickly for us and, and work with us. Um, we had a, a company called Valor that was making our diapers down in, down in Mexico, um, and they're fantastic partners. They would they would fix any issues that we would have and so forth. But it was really just kind of you know getting to that type of volume that quickly too. Working with factories um, that you know could crank out that type of product and 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 hit our growth rates that we we're hitting and working with us. So it, it it wasn't it wasn't easy by any means, right? It was it was just more you know working in concert with team partners, vendors, you know all of it. Having a celebrity like Jessica Alba as a partner is is obviously very helpful. There's a lot of exposure that comes with that, especially early on. But having a celebrity isn't everything. And a lot of celebrity-driven products have failed, uh, like a lot. <laughs> so in your opinion, what is missing in some of these brands that don't make it? You know, I actually think it's it's not necessarily the celebrity. It's mostly the team. Right. It's mostly the team and it's, um, you know, you have to really surround, if you're a celebrity, you have to surround yourself with the right, right team that can execute uh, on your vision. Uh, and also it has to be authentic. You know, I've seen a lot of times where, where a celebrity will promote something or an influencer will promote something that just doesn't make sense to promote. Like, you know, it's just, you know, you'll have a, a, you know, an MMA wrestler who wants to start a furniture company. It's like, what do you have to do with furniture? I don't know. Right. So there's the, sometimes there's that disconnect, but if there isn't, if there really is authentic, you know, uh, belief in what you're doing and, and, and people f- find it, consumers find it to be authentic then. And if it doesn't work it's probably the team. And so I, I actually always like as an investor myself, you know, I invest in teams. I don't invest in ideas, right? Ideas are, are, are a dime a dozen, as you know, so. So with the Honest Company, you set out and raised quite a bit of money. Uh, unlike LegalZoom, you raised $27 million, I believe, at the launch. How did you end up at that number? And, and I'm also curious how you set a valuation, given that the company was pre-revenue. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So um, I knew we had to raise a significant amount of money because I, I knew the, the, the roadmap, you know, the, the volume of product that we had to bring in the door you know, for these types of, you know, products from the baby shampoos, to the wipes to the diapers were, was significant. I mean, you can't just order, you know, 10 packs of wipes to get started. You know, you're going to have to order millions of dollars worth. And so, and I also knew that, you know, the advertising was getting expensive. So unlike LegalZoom, where it was cheap, it was one cent per click, or unlike Shoe Dazzle, where we kind of latched on to the earliest days of Facebook marketing, where it was inefficient, and so we took advantage of that inefficiency. Um, that wasn't the case for the Honest Company. And so we kind of had to raise enough capital to go out there and, and really promote it and market it and advertise and, and so forth. So we needed some, some more capital. Uh, fortunately... You know, we had the right partners who, who gave us that capital and light speed. Uh, it was General Catalyst um, and, um, and IVP. So those three kind of believed in it. IVP was an investor in LegalZoom. Uh, Lightspeed was an investor in Shoe Dazzle. And General Catalyst were, were friends of mine. I'm still close with Neil Sakira, uh, who's now at Defy. Um, but they just believed in us. They believed in it. The, the, the craziest thing happens, Trey is when you're an entrepreneur first starting out, it's tough, honestly, to raise capital. And we all, we all know that. Um, and you really have to hustle and round up as much money as you can. When, when, when you have a company that's already successful, it's already, it, it, it's so much easier to raise capital, right? It's like um, success begets 
you know, success, right? And so raising that 27 million was actually not that difficult. We had even more than the 27 million available to us. Um, we could have probably raised, you know, 50 or 60 you know, just to start the company, but we needed about 27, 28 to, to hit our plan for the next two years. A lot of uh, entrepreneurs romanticize about the day of going public because it represents sort of a, a finish line to some degree, even though it's a starting line in a lot of ways. Um, but for a lot of founders, it's the opportunity to, to kind of cash in on the sweat equity they put in early on. And not that that was necessarily your, your route, I'm not sure, but I'm curious because The Honest Company and LegalZoom are both now public. They both went public about a year ago. Was there anything meaningful to you about the companies actually going public or were they kind of too far in the rear view at that point to, to really care or, or, you know, feel anything from that? Oh, no, absolutely. Felt a lot of pride in having these companies go public um, and being part of them, uh, part of their history. Um, but to me, it was this, I don't know, I, 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 it's more just a check mark, right? No, I'm taking the company public. You know, started a company that went public. Um, it, it wasn't, you know, a cause for celebration, I don't think. It, it's just more, you know, that's the new structure of the company. You have, you know, public investors and, and that's that. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a, a, another, you know, I guess, uh, just a period, a season of the company. See, I find that so funny because I, I, it's often that you romanticize about these things. And when they finally come, you're just like, all right, another day, let's keep going. <laughs> but uh, but were, was the idea of going public for either of those companies something that got you out of bed in those early days with that dream or something of that sort? Was that something kind of driving you early on? No, never. Yeah, I was. I, I never was driven by by you know taking a company public. Um, I'm driven by building something great. Right. I I I, I like building things that that will last, um, and be around for for decades. Uh, and so that's what drives me is that is the impact that I like to uh, that I would like to make. Um, as opposed to, you know, dreaming of taking a company public. It, it, it's more, you know, can we build a beautiful business, right? That, that, that has staying power, right? That, that's much more fulfilling to me than, you know, the, uh, the IPOs or even selling a company for a large amount. It, it, it's really, uh, is this company going to be around? You know, will my grandchildren say my granddad started that company or helped start that company? That's what, that's what I look for. And I think that's exactly why you are success, as successful as you are. You, <laughs> you had a, a brief, uh, you know, you, you've had this opportunity now to sit on the other side of the table as a, as a VC. And yeah. one of your early checks was into a company called Honey that's now gone on to sell to PayPal for $4 billion. And PayPal is obviously another public company now. And so what did you see in this company Honey early on that led to such a, a massive success? I saw a strong team. Right, I saw George and Ryan, uh, George, Ron, and Ryan. They, uh, I remember, I gave a speech, a, a talk once at a um, like a like an accelerator program, and I remember they they came up to me afterwards and they were kind of describing what they were working on, and it sounded interesting. And so I took a meeting with them afterwards, and I just really liked them. I thought they were incredibly smart. They seemed very dedicated to what they were going to build. Um, cause this is the early stages of, of honey is where we invested. Um, and I just, I, I, I honestly just like them. <laughs> it's, it's hard to describe it, but I, I just kind of have this sense of entrepreneurs and, you know, if they're, if they're the type of entrepreneurs I want to back, meaning will they just keep going? Are they going to give it their hundred percent all the time like is this if this doesn't work basically you know what happens it's like you want entrepreneurs like this has to work for them and i've got that feeling from them from george and ryan well you've now had an opportunity to become a ceo again which is also interesting this time you're partnering with derek jeter talk to us about arena club and why you felt compelled to start building again 
so yeah, I'm, I'm super excited uh, to be CEO again for the fourth time. Um, and we're launching the company on September 8th, you know, knock on wood, hopefully. And um, uh, Derek Jeter has been fantastic to, to, to work with on this. And it's in the trading card category. And so baseball, basketball cards, uh, we were using computer vision and machine learning to grade sports cards. And then we digitize them, put them on blockchain, and then create these digital marketplaces where you can buy, sell, and trade cards with other showrooms, other online showrooms. And so that's really the, um, the idea. I've been collecting cards my whole life. It's, um, I started as a kid and I never stopped collecting cards in high school and college, law school. Um, I remember when I was at Skadden, my very first paycheck from the law firm, I bought more cards. <laughs> and so it's something that I've been doing for a long time. And I started collecting with my son probably about six years ago when he was about seven years old. Um, and, you know, my happiest days are really going to the card shops and card shows with him. And so I kind of like took this hobby slash passion into starting a company here. Um, it's, it's, I'm building something that I would want as a hobbyist, right. As a collector. And it's just something that's never really existed where, you know, you have this, you know, this social kind of marketplace as opposed to what exists today, uh, it's much more about community and a club, which is why it's called arena club.com. And so we're super excited to launch it on, on September 8th. And hopefully some of your listeners will come check it out. Absolutely. And you know, Derek Jeter is obviously a legend, but there's there's a lot of amazing baseball players out there. Why Derek Jeter and how did that relationship come to be? Well, he's a captain. <laughs> That's why I actually consider Derek Jeter one of the greatest ball players who have ever lived, who have ever you know uh, swung a bat. And so, just his leadership ability, his 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 demeanor, he's incredibly smart um, and dedicated. And so, I I, I think. Um, you know, and this really resonates with him. And so through some mutual friends, I got to know Derek and um, I think uh, it's going to be a fantastic launch for, for us. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll see, we'll see what happens. You never know. So we'll see what happens. Now, are you finding that you're, you are bringing a certain playbook to each company that maybe iterates over the life of each company, or is it sort of starting fresh and dependent on the opportunity and the team and and are you starting from scratch uh, when you get down into it, or or is there something you're you're a platform you're jumping off from? I think it's kind of there's a little bit of platform because it's more just experience as a platform, but it, it's you know the, completely different categories, right? So legal Zoom, from law to selling women's high heel shoes to selling diapers to a trading card service, none of them are are all that related. Um, and I've never it's like. I don't know how to explain this, but I, I think I actually am missing an antenna when it comes to like, you know, not understanding things and, and, and just trying things without the experience, but it, it's, it's never, it's never stopped me because I, I just kind of figure, you know, none of this is rocket science. It's business. <laughs> it just is. And it's like, yes. Are there different margin profiles, metrics and different marketing tactics and everything else? Sure but it's stuff that you can learn. Right. And, and sometimes it's like, as an outsider, sometimes you bring a fresh perspective into an industry and that's what we're trying to do again, you know, with, with, uh, with arena club, uh, I'll, I'll give you an example at shoe dazzle back in the day. I remember we had, you know, the capital raised, we had the website built, we had, you know, uh, the marketing geared up. Kim Kardashian was ready to promote. We had everything, but we had no shoes, right? Because none of us knew shoes. But we were told like, oh, you could just go to um, this area and they've got all these warehouses uh, that will sell you shoes. And so we went and we were picking out some shoes and we're like, I'll take a hundred pairs of that and a hundred pairs of this one. And they're looking at us like we're nuts, right? And they're like, no, the minimum order is 2,500 pairs, right? And we're like, uh-oh, right? So we got to kind of stop you know, the launch and, and find partners to work with us to create, you know, shoe dazzle shoes. Um, and so that kind of put a delay on things, but, um, and then, and then I remember when we launched, I, I went to my first shoe show, right. It was the, the world shoe association in Las Vegas. And this is when the WSA was gigantic. I mean, they took over like two big convention centers. 
And I really think like if I had seen that before we launched Shoe Dazzle, I don't think I would have launched Shoe Dazzle for fear. <laughs> right? And like just so seeing how many companies were producing shoes and trying to sell shoes, I was just like, oh my goodness, this is this is nuts. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna succeed. I'm competing against a thousand million, you know, retailers and people trying to sell shoes. But sometimes it's like better not to know. <laughs> Not always, but sometimes, sometimes it's better not to know, you know, and even with diapers, I mean, I didn't know how to make a diaper. The, I remember the first time I saw um, a diaper machine, it, they're gigantic. I'm not sure if you've ever seen one, Trey, but, but they're, they're the size of like a convention. The, 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 it just goes on forever, like just going and making these diapers. I was like, wow, that's fascinating. I had no idea, you know, but you learn, right? And that's the one thing about me is like, I'm not scared to learn. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs are probably the same way. You know, I, I actually enjoy learning. I enjoy learning new industries. I enjoy meeting new networks. You know, I enjoy everything about it. And so, you know, starting a company in trading cards, I'm meeting a lot of cool people, you know, like people I like, like, wow, it's so, it's so neat that you have like this Honus Wagner or PSA two, you know, or whatever. It's like, you're meeting so many people. It's like, it's fascinating to me. So I'm having a lot of fun learning again. What's an example of how Brian Lee approaches work today versus the Brian Lee that was starting LegalZoom? It's a great question. I, I think it's um, a lot of it's the same. I think I've always been a really, really hard worker. Um, I'm, I, I'm pretty focused once I'm you know, in the groove. I've, 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 I think I've gotten smarter in terms of time management Right. I, I understand, you know, how to structure my tasks a little bit better um, and how to kind of lessen my workload in certain areas that I know others can do better. And that that's something that you'll learn over time also as an entrepreneur is that, you know, you like to control everything. Like I like to control everything, but you can't. Right. And it's something that you that I've learned over time um, is that. You know, delegation to the right folks at the right time is key, right? You've got to let people run, right? And you've got to trust them to run. Um, and so that's kind of um, something that I've learned over time to, to let go of is that control. When you're building like this and, and getting a team around you, it, it's similar to when you're you know, in a marriage where you have kind of to fill up your own cup, right? <laughs> to, to be there for the other people. And I'm curious how you foster or develop your own personal growth in order to be a leader uh, for your organizations. A lot of it's just like self analyzation too, right? I'm I'm, I'm pretty self-aware of my limitations, right? And I I work on those limitations, but there's only so much you could do also because you're born a certain way, really. It's like you can try to, to, to change yourself, but at some point, you know, it's hard. Right. So I understand, you know, how to buttress myself, right. With the right team, with the right people. Um, you know, for example, like even my wife, my, my, my home life, right. It was, I, I luckily found the right partner who is really my partner. Right. And, 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 and it really makes me, you know, a better husband, a better father. Right. It's the same way with being a CEO. You got to find the right partners that, that are going to help you be, the best CEO you can be, right? And that's really understanding you know, what you're lacking, right? And being, you know, understanding and, and self-aware of, of your weaknesses. Because you've been on both sides of the table and, and you know, I know adventure is kind of its own thing, but are there investors that you've studied or you look up to or, or you kind of feel like your style matches up as closely with theirs? Someone, where did you kind of pick up your investing style? Yeah, I, I, I really look up to, you know, really two investors. It's Jeremy Liu from Lightspeed, who has just recently left Lightspeed uh, to, to kind of, um, you know, to take some time off. Um, but he's fantastic. And also Neil Secura uh, over at Defy Ventures. These are my, probably my two favorite investors in the world. Um, and the reason I say that is because I've, 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 gone through so many ups and downs in my career and they've always been supportive. And that's a true sign of a, I think a great investor. 
it's a it's someone who is absolutely there when you need them right when you need their advice when you need their help but they let you run when you don't right they're not all up in your business trying to get metrics from you every day you know or trying to insert themselves into into whatever it's like they they understand their role right and they they they'd like to be helpful um and the other thing is that i think great investors don't change their colors in good times or bad times right they're there for you again when you need them but they let you run so i i've had investors in the past who when things go south they're all up in your business right we've all many of us have dealt with these types of investors and and they actually think that they could go and fix it themselves so they start inserting themselves more and more and more right doesn't work that way man it just doesn't you know it's like as an investor you could suggest things you could try to advise you could try to mentor right but you can't run the company right if if, if the only thing you could probably possibly do is fire the ceo right and bring in a new management team sure you could do that right but you're still not running the company yourself Right, unless you decide to fire the CEO and become the CEO yourself, <laughs> but that that rarely is the case. That that doesn't happen with the venture capitalists, right? So, or rarely. Um, so I think again, the best I think investors are ones that are supportive when you need them and and let you run when you don't. Given that team and culture is such a cornerstone for you and your investment style, it, it just kind of dawned on me that with public companies you don't often get that insight necessarily where it's a little bit harder to tease out what a company culture is, you know, for a public company, you know what the management is doing oftentimes, and you can pick up a lot from that. I'm aware of, you know, stories around Southwest airlines, for example, putting up photos of each employee and, and hugging each other. And there's a lot of stories you kind of pick up here and there from certain public companies. But if you were investing in the public companies, how would you be looking for if a company had great culture or not? Um, I would actually probably do as much research as I can in, in their team members and understand like, just as you just named off, you know, Southwest's, you know, culture, you could probably do a lot of digging and just find out what that culture is for the company and whether or not it resonates with what you believe in and what you want to invest behind. Um, it doesn't, it, it doesn't take much to, to reach out to some folks and, on LinkedIn even, and, and just talk to them. Fascinating. So we are super excited to see what happens with Arena Club oh, and okay. congratulations on this. It's very, very, very exciting. Before I let you go, first of all, I want to just say thank you for all the time you spent with us today. It's, it's, we know how valuable your time is and we really, really appreciate it because you're providing so much value here for our listeners. And before I let you go, I just want to make sure everyone has a handoff to where they want to find you or, or arena club or any other resources you want to share. Yeah. I think it's just arena club.com. Come check it out. You know, if you're a card collector, you know, try it out. Uh, I think you'll enjoy it. Fantastic. Again, Brian, thank you so much for coming on and best of luck. We'll talk soon. Thank you, Trey, for having me. Thank you so much. Bye. Anytime you sell an option, you're actually selling volatility. Whenever you buy an option, you're buying volatility. So volatility and options kind of go hand in hand because volatility goes into pricing options. 